All right, and could you go into more depth about his theology and uh, his use of scripture? Yeah, so what's at the heart of Niebuhr's theology? Um, it's a good question, and it's actually not that different from the social gospel. It's just that it's taking sin and its effects a lot more seriously, right? And understanding sin as something that um, infects social systems as well as individuals. So, you know, the way that I would put it, you know, what's what's at the heart of Niebuhr's thought? It's, it's a question, right? How do sinful people bear witness to God's love in a broken world? Each piece of that's very important for Niebuhr. How do sinful people bear witness to God's love in a broken world? And the way that he worked that out in a more practical way is he saw, you know, what we call justice as basically the outgrowth of trying to bear witness to God's love, right? If you want justice out in the world, you're going to have to aim much higher than justice, right? You're going to have to aim for love and you're going to have to aim for agapic love, you know, the self-giving love exemplified in Jesus. Um, Niebuhr described that love as the impossible possibility, right? As broken, sinful people, can you and I um, really, truly emulate that love? No. But we sure are under an obligation to try. And in that process of striving to embody that love, um, that's where we find grace. That's where we find those moments where the kingdom of God breaks in and we encounter these, these moments of redemption. And if we lean into that hard enough, we end up with something that might look like justice on the other side. So for him, love and justice were very much linked. Um, you know, the way, the way Cornell West has, has famously put it is justice is what love looks like in public. Hmm. Um, and that's a very Niburian kind of sentiment, right? You, you, you want um, some workable form of justice. You're going to have to aim really high to get there. And could you more, you already touched on it, but you, could you go into more depth about the, his view of the kingdom of God and of Jesus himself? Um, so how, you know, how did Niebuhr understand the kingdom? Um, you know, it's helpful to think of Niebuhr because he was very much in dialogue with the Swiss German, you know, uh, World War One, World War Two era theologian Karl Barth. And Karl Barth, coming out of a Reformed tradition, uh, really emphasized the kingdom of God is already here, right? That's what Jesus inaugurated, right? Um, God became human. Um, Jesus, you know, bears witness to the kingdom, teaches us how to bear witness to it as well. Um, and so the kingdom of God is already here. Our job is to bear witness to what Jesus has already done, the redemption that's already been accomplished. Um, Niebuhr would agree on Jesus as the focal point, right? You know, we want to understand what God's self-giving love is. We look to Jesus for that. Uh, Jesus inaugurates the beginning of the kingdom, but the work remains very much incomplete this side of history. So, you know, the job of, you, for Niebuhr, the job of you and I as Christians is to participate as much as we can in the very incomplete building of that kingdom now, right? We catch moments of that inbreaking. Um, you know, when when improbable things happen, um, improbable moments of justice happen in history, you know, I think he'd look at certain moments in the civil rights moment, uh, a civil rights movement as these glimpses where there's this moment of inbreaking, right? Um, and we we labor to be a part of those moments as best we can. And we labor in the faith that, you know, at some point beyond history, um, God can make our striving mean something, can fold it into this larger redemptive story. Um, but we must not have any illusions that we can, you know, point to precisely where the kingdom is settling on earth right now. And how did uh, Niebuhr understand and use scripture? Um, so scripture for Niebuhr, you know, we can think of him, he was an ethicist, 
more than anything. And he was a social ethicist. He's one of the founding figures of, of Christian social ethics in, in America as a, as a discipline. Um, so he really was relentlessly focused on these questions of um, how do we enact justice right now? And, you know, for him, scripture was a, a resource for doing just that. He loved the prophets. Because if you want to tease a social ethic out of the Bible, um, you find some of that in the New Testament, but really the bulk of that ethic is in the prophetic books of the Old Testament, right? Where you really have this, this you know, fine-grained honing out of, okay, this is what it means for God to be on the side of the poor and the widow and the orphan, right? And these are the ways that God opposes those that oppress the poor, the widow, and the orphan. And if we want a template for, for how to, you know, become participants in the incomplete building of the kingdom, we go to the prophetic books of the Bible. And so the other thing that we get out of those books is how, um, and this is, you know, where you see the Lutheran side to, to Niebuhr working, we are perpetually both under God's judgment and God's mercy, right? Those are realities that hover over every moment of human history. And they're both true at all times. And so that's this tension that, that Niebuhr's working with as he's reading scripture. Um, but besides the prophetic books, he, you know, would also reach back to, you know, when he's reading Genesis, for instance, he isn't asking the question of, was the earth created in the literal seven days? He had zero interest in that question. I, I don't think I'm doing Niebuhr any injustice in saying he just didn't find that question interesting. Uh, far more interesting to him was what does the story of Adam and Eve tell us about human vulnerability and our struggle to trust in God? Hmm. And why does that struggle get replicated in every single one of our lives? He took the concept of original sin very seriously. And it was rooted in, you know, we all at some point fail the trust test, <laughs> right? We, we try to take our fate in our own hands in a way that we're really not supposed to. It's something we're supposed to trust God with. Um, another way that we see him, you know, using these stories to loom in the present is the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, you know, he had this, this collection of essays for, you know, some in your audience might actually find it really interesting. It's called Beyond Tragedy. And it was published in 1937. So this, you, you can imagine what the world scene is looking like in 1937. Um, Niebuhr was one of the first people that was saying, we're going to have to join World War II eventually. We're not going to be able to duck this conflict. He was aware, in part because he was German-American, felt the responsibility to keep his father country honest. Um, he was aware of what Nazis were doing to Jews at the time and was sounding the alarm bell on that. Um, but in the midst of that, he publishes this collection of, of sermons, sermonic essays called Beyond Tragedy. And in one of the essays, he says, OK, we have this temptation to try to tell the story of history or the story of civilization as one of progress. Right. We started small. Right. And we, we gradually built up to something great. Or we want to tell the story of history as one of irrevocable collapse. Right. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, there's nothing we can really do about it. Um, except trust in God. And he's saying, how about we use the Tower of Babel as a better model for how to read history, right? Um, because this is the way that that sin operates. It's, it's most destructive, not when we're doing things that are obviously bad. It's more destructive. It's most destructive when we're pursuing our ideals and ulterior motives seep into those ideals, right? So we go on building this thing that we think is just wonderful and amazing and don't see the ulterior motives that are seeping into our projects don't see the ways that we're distorting these ideals to serve our own ends and so it introduces rot into the very foundations of the things we try to build um so when our projects come tumbling down when the societies that we think are amazing start to show cracks um part of what niebuhr took from the tower of babel is there's actually mercy in the crumbling because it means that we can finally deal with the way that sin seeped into, you know, even our best laid plans and our mm -hmm. highest ideals. 
And, you know, when these things crumble, we're still left with a lot of good things that we did in the process of building those things, right? The pieces are all there and we can rebuild, you know, this time in ways where we, we don't replicate the same mistakes. So, you know, he takes the story of the Tower of Babel. It's really just it, the Tower of Babel narrative in Genesis. Is, it's something like 12 or 13 verses long. It's short. Um, and uses it as a motif for how to read history and how human nature enters into, you know, how the sinful aspect of human nature infects our historical projects, but how there's mercy when those projects start to fall apart and we rebuild. And how, you know, part of the life of faith is to go about the rebuilding process, trusting that God can take even the imperfect things that we do and make something good out of them. Please check out more videos from The Charge. Don't forget to click on like and hit the subscribe button.